even when we move from one space to another space, you'll be able to have the full screen, the full screen experience of me, but you'll also be able to then see the, um, uh, the, the, the overlay on the slides that are there. So hopefully you won't just see a small little me in the corner. Right, so welcome. It's, it's great to have you all here. We, we've got a, a good turnout. I'm, I'm hoping for a really good discussion today. Um, this is a, a, a SASE workshop, South African Society of Engineering Education, a uh, workshop on good practices. Uh, there's no, re no need really, I suppose, to give you a um, uh, background on our, on our move to emergency remote teaching in the online space during, uh, uh, during March last year. It happened very quickly for everybody. And all of us, to some, to some extent or another, have had to deal with the uncertainty associated with doing that, but also how to keep our students engaged. Because there's no doubt that the, the, engaging in this online space is very different to engaging in the classroom. And so what we've got is we've got a, a, few, a, a, a workshop that we put together today with um, Maggie Chetty and uh, Johnson Carroll and myself together with the rest of the SASE board to, to give you an opportunity to hear some good practice from, from um, four individuals that we've identified who, who will uh, present some case studies to you, as well as an opportunity for all of us to actually to be able to engage around this idea and to be able to talk to each other about what's worked, what's not worked, and then eventually, as a as a group, we'll be able to almost think of it as crowdsourcing. We can crowdsource um, good practices amongst ourselves, so that we, as we're preparing for our new year, we can really be in a place that to maximise engagement of our, our students in our in our classes. Um, so, if you see the, the the slides that are in in front of you, if you if you've pinned me and you see them fairly large, and I'm going to do this on my monitor on the side here, so that I can also see what you're seeing. Um, what you um, we'll see is that on the right hand side of your screen there, we've, we've got a, a short four minute um, presentation um, by Karen Wolf on a, an ERT research project that's been undertaken recently that, that looks to understand the transition to emergency remote teaching in the engineering education sector. So that's just a, a warm up as it were to, to sort of lay the, set the scene. Then we're going to look at some case studies. We can have a breakout session and then we will come back and close out with a plenary session. And hopefully you will, through, throughout this process, you'll be given the opportunity to engage amongst each other and with each other about sort of burning issues and, and things like that. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at then is, is this uh, Dr. Karen Wolf's, uh, the impact of emergency remote teaching on engineering educators. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flick to full screen there, and now I'm going to share my screen. And in sharing my screen, what that'll do is I'll then share the the video that um, Karen put together about this. So just give me a moment while I get to that. And like so. And you should now see the full screen. And now we'll play the video. When COVID hit the world, the media. Sorry, I'll start that again. When COVID hit the world, the media were quick to talk about the long-awaited technological revolution in education. But the first impact reports confirmed that the sudden shift to emergency remote teaching presented significant challenges, not the least of which were the lack of digital fluency and a host of access-related challenges for both staff and students. While most of the impact studies focused on student needs and experiences of emergency remote teaching, there was little formal focus on the effects of ERT on educators, particularly in fields requiring practical technologies for learning and research, such as engineering. The South African Society for Engineering Education is dedicated to growing and supporting a community of practice comprising academics, support staff, postgraduates, management industry and professional bodies, all interested in promoting excellence in engineering education. As a society, we were concerned about how to support our members in these challenging times. Our strength lies in providing forums for sharing, networking and disseminating engineering education information. But to determine how to support our members, we needed to know how they were experiencing emergency remote teaching. In conjunction with Stellenbosch University, we conducted a national survey between August and September in 2020, taking a holistic approach 
looking at the professional, personal and practical impacts of emergency remote teaching on engineering academics and postgraduates. The survey asked four key qualitative questions about the effect of ERT on the working environment, the implementation of communication measures, and invited comments on key challenges and successes. The responses were analysed using three educational support dimensions, the cognitive, affective and systemic. The survey drew over 20,000 words of rich descriptive narratives from over 60 participants across engineering sectors in various roles. When asked about environmental challenges, they were the expected descriptions of challenges in working from home with regard to sharing space with other family members, particularly those with small children. Access to devices, data, effective bandwidth, equipment all cropped up. And this in fact sensitised many of the respondents to their student situations. Every imaginable platform made its appearance in the question around communication measures. By far the most common complaint was around the issue of online forums. What is clear from the data is how overwhelmed staff felt by the information overload they experienced. Again, this had the effect, in a few cases, of making academics and support staff aware of how they communicated with their students. The challenge section of the survey drew by far the most detail, from comments on the time-consuming re repurposing of activities, the recording of lectures, to poor student engagement. By far the most common challenge cited was that of stress and exhaustion. And then there were the reflections on success. Many report having spent more quality time with family. There is data on the benefits of remote working, particularly for those who wish to miss the commute. And a significant number developed strategies that they feel will be useful going forward. If you'd like to read more about this research project and other engineering education initiatives, please visit our website www.sasee.org.za. Right, Corin, thank you very much for that, uh, that introduction in setting the scene as it were. And I'm sure all of you recognized in those results or in the outcomes of that study, you, you recognize things in yourself and you recognize what, what your colleagues have been saying. And now it's time to, to, to move on to the section of the, of the, of the workshop here where we, we have, bring some case studies um, to your attention of, of people that have done some really good work in, in trying to ensure that, that students remain engaged, that they manage to, to, to learn, that you manage to teach in a, in a way that, that in, enables learning. And to do that, let me get back to this particular slide over here. Um, we've got three groups of presentations that are going to take place now. We've got uh, Johnson and, and Helen are going to, to kick off. Then we've got Debbie, Debbie Blaine, and Megan Govender, who are, who are going to then round out the case studies that we're going to present. And so there's, there's 15, minutes, uh, 15 minutes for each of these case studies. And these are, these are we, we, we ask, we, we task the presenters with being sort of informal, casual, in a sense, to try and sort of engage with you around what they've done, what good practices that they've drawn on. And then afterwards, what we're going to do is we're going to split you into three groups and you're going to have the opportunity to engage amongst yourselves and, and each one of these groups of people that are presenting case studies will be will be facilitating the conversations in there um, to be able to sort of draw out from these conversations and conversations your own about what's what's challenged and what's worked for you. So we're going to start now with with a presentation by by Johnson and and Helen. What they've done is they they recorded their presentation last night. And they are also here with us today. So if something goes wrong, they, they will be able to just pick up the pieces. 
Um, and then Debbie and Megan have got uh, live presentations for you in starting in about 15 minutes time. All right then, so let me, without any further ado, I will then set up uh, Johnson and, and Helen's presentation, just like I did for Corin a few moments ago. The, 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 I am monitoring the chat. Um, so if there's anything that you're wanting to send to me uh, um, uh, privately or to, the, to the, the group as a whole, feel, feel free to do so. Right, so what I'm going to do now is once again, going to share my screen and I'm going to share the presentation by Johnson and Helen. Make sure that the sound is working, computer sound. And now you should have their presentation starting now. Hello and welcome to this first session. I'm Johnson Carroll. I'm Helen Ingalls. And we're going to be talking about online assessment, some of the approaches and lessons that we've learned and talked about over the last year. So in March last year, when everything suddenly went online, one of the huge issues that we were facing was the issue of how do we now assess online? And what we're presenting today is is what we learned, but it's really based on discussions we made in that emergency mode. And we came up with the best plan we could find at the time. We're definitely not experts on this, but we talk to each other a lot. And we talk to lots of other people. And today we're continuing those conversations with you and we're hoping to learn from you some more of the approaches that you've taken. So just to put us on the same page, what is assessment for? We see kind of two components that assessment is designed to evaluate learning, but also to promote learning. And in amongst and between and around these, we have smaller purposes such as increasing student engagement, providing feedback, setting some structure and pacing, and some others. The traditional way we do assessment is frankly problematic. Not all of us do assessment this way, but at the University of Pretoria, for instance, in the engineering faculty, we have a structure where we have two semester tests and a big exam. Most of the marks earned in a course come from these high stakes assessments, which are run with strict security and strict, and strict logistics. And the evaluation is really dominated by the big assessment of the exam. And this promotes some learning behaviors which are not ideal. It encourages students to delay learning until the test and then cram for the test to memorize rather than doing deep learning. And even before we went online, we had some of these problems. So when we move teaching and learning to the online environment, there are a number of features of that space that impact both directly and indirectly on assessment. Most importantly, it's a very new environment for both us and for the students. And thinking of assessment, whether you want it to be or not, it's going to be an open book assessment. It's also quite difficult to know who exactly is participating in your classes and the class activities. And the expectations of students and learning are uncertain because it's so new. So as you can imagine, in this setting, the traditional way of doing assessment with these high stakes, high security and logistics uh, assessment scenarios is going to be a problem. It's important that we talk about cheating. I don't like to spend my time thinking about cheating. I'd much rather spend my time thinking about learning, but it's a preoccupation of a lot of people in the university. The students are preoccupied about cheating because of fairness issues. Um, our management are preoccupied about cheating because of how we certify results. So looking in the literature, we can find some things that increase cheating, particularly high stakes testing, a lack of surveillance and the opportunity to cheat are all factors that increase cheating. Well, we can't do a lot about the lack of surveillance or the opportunity to cheat. These are the realities of online assessment. But we can do something about the other factors. One of the most important things I think we should be doing is having lower stakes assessment, more frequent assessments, which each count less. Another factor is to allow students to fail tasks safely so that they don't feel that it's a huge risk to try something difficult. We can also work on the engagement by relating assessment directly to learning, mutual respect and trust. And I think that last one's quite important. If we don't trust the students and we show them that we don't trust them, 
then they will behave as if we don't trust them. In the end, we do the best we can to, it, to limit cheating and then we have to let it go. It's not like we didn't have cheating when we were doing in-person assessments. So after extensive discussions, here are a few of the things that we came up with that we believe should characterize good online assessment. The assessment should have lower stakes as far as possible throughout. The assessment should be designed really to drive learning and to drive student pacing of their learning. We should discourage the cheating structurally as far as possible. The assessment activities should be sustainable both for the students and for the staff. Assessment activities should be designed with empathy. We should be taking into account the different situations in which our students find themselves. And we should naturally and from the beginning incorporate backup plans to reduce the risk and the anxiety. So ultimately what we're probably talking about is some form of continuous assessment rather than that traditional examination based assessment. Continuous assessment could describe a lot of different structures, but it gives us the flexibility to lower the stakes of the assessment throughout and also to structure the assessment to give students room to fail and learn from their mistakes. And just to note, it can still include a summative assessment at the end requiring students to bring things all together, just not that extremely high stakes, giant portion of the final mark that the examination would provide. And because continuous assessment is quite flexible, there's a lot of room for a lot of great ideas, but we do need to keep in mind that many great ideas might not be great ideas for this particular context. So here are just a few ideas, uh, examples of things that ideas that people have floated to me or some of which I've proposed to other people, including Helen, that ultimately are not feasible or fair to the students or to the staff or perhaps to the institution where the assessment is taking place. So based on the principles we, we talked about, we have come up with this approach to assessment where we have a hierarchy of assessments. We have hierarchies of stakes of assessments. Some of them count very little, some of them count more. We have hierarchies of depth of assessment. At the lowest level, based on each individual lecture, we have frequent low stakes assessments. Asking students to ask themselves the question, did I understand what happened in the lecture? At the next level, perhaps once a week or once every two weeks, we have slightly higher stakes assessments, which are more difficult problems, more complete problems, where we're asking students to apply the concepts they've learned to problems, to integrate concepts from a number of lectures into um, solving a more, a more comprehensive problem. And then at the highest level, we have the least frequent, highest stakes assessment. In these, we're not just asking students to, to recall what they've done in that week, but perhaps these are assessments that come after a few weeks of semester or perhaps at the end of the semester, where they must, not, they must also identify which methods are appropriate for solving the problems. So these higher stakes assessments can and perhaps should be different formats of assessment and are summative in nature, but are not the behemoth of a giant exam that counts for the vast majority of a mark. The weight of the assessment is distributed through the semester in a more even way. If you think about how we've built from these more frequent assessments to the more summative things, you can imagine it almost like Bloom's taxonomy sideways. But this wasn't really what we were trying to achieve. We were looking more at the structure of the assessment, driving and pacing the type of learning that we thought would best support students online. In essence, the lower stakes assessment, which have multiple opportunities for students to fail, make the higher stakes assessments less intimidating. They help make up for the lack of traditional engagements and they really incentivize students to use the learning resources to learn. This is an example of how I did the assessment in an actual large third year class last year. I had 300 students. The low stakes assessment had unlimited attempts. 
You could also do badly on quite a few of them and, or miss a few of them and it wouldn't hurt your mark because we dropped some of them and you had a long time to complete them. The higher stakes assessments had much more had tightly controlled um, time limits and number of opportunities, but I was available to um, give students an extra, extra ticket to access the test if something went wrong. And note that although it was a two hour test, I had a four hour window in which they could complete it. So that meant that if something went wrong with their computer falling over at the point at which they tried to enter, that wasn't a crisis for them. All of this is designed to lower the stakes of the assessments. Even the highest stakes ass assessments had an opportunity for a catch up if there was a problem. And this lowered the stress level of the students. It also lowered the stress level of the lecturer. And just to note that one test that was written before, the, before everything was thrust online, we discussed at some length whether that should even be weighted less and if we were going to do this with the entire semester online, that that 40% would be very much distributed across multiple tests or perhaps just across the other components. The longer assessments had some other features. Um, we used random pools of test questions so that students didn't all get the same questions. We used calculated formula questions with randomly assigned values so that they looked different. We asked students to write answers with a file upload and on those we asked them to handwrite a statement of integrity and sign it. We had a flexible submission window and we had a makeup version to allow for students who missed the assessment. Some of these features are clearly designed to prevent or at least discourage cheating, but others are looking at other of those desirable features of online assessment such as sustainability, making it not too difficult for the lecturer if something goes wrong and you need a backup plan. Now, one of the reasons that we talked about this at great length multiple times was that these are new structures, new ways of assessing, new ways of designing the assessment in a module, and they may not be covered by your institution's policies. I'm not suggesting you should go outside of the policy, but the rules for examinations are much more explicit than the rules for other types of assessment. So when you're engaging in a new type of assessment, especially if you're coming from an environment with very strict or standardized forms of assessment, you must engage with stakeholders early and often, all of the stakeholders, and especially your moderator. Bringing the moderator into the conversation while you're designing the assessment plan is very important for making sure that this lines up with the expectations and the standards that everyone needs them to. In summary, here are some of the things that we learned during this last year of online assessment. Some positive things, I noticed that students were much more consistently engaged with the module. They were much less likely to be cramming information before the semester test or the exam. In feedback, they reported a much greater sense of control over their learning, and they reported that they felt more confident about their understanding. On the other hand, some of the things that we have discussed and that Helen did in her module were simply not sustainable. Creating alternate questions, trying to systematically implement some of those techniques for varied assessment are an incredible amount of lecturer effort that doesn't seem to be just a learning curve. It's something that will still be that much effort in the future. Both students and staff can be overwhelmed just with the quantity of assessment, even if it's low stakes. I heard feedback from students at UJ that they were just feeling that they were constantly being tested again and again with all of their modules. And finally, we've been hearing from a variety of sources that the things that we did that we've just described were in the first semester of last year. Now we're several months into doing things online. Students are becoming more comfortable with what learning and being assessed online is like. And so we can expect their ability to find ways to circumvent the assessment to be evolving as we move forward. Thank you for this opportunity to share our experiences 
we know that there's still so much to be done. I'm busy designing my assessment for this semester and I'm, I'm a little bit more experienced than I was last year, but there's still a lot that I can learn from you and hopefully we'll have a really great discussion later. We're looking forward to those conversations. Thanks so much. Helen and, uh, and, and uh, Johnson, thank you very much. Um, so what I, I, I think what's, what's interesting also to, to think about is, is the, the nature of the different presentation that you're experiencing at the moment. Um, so the first one with, with Karen was, there was no little picture, so it was, it was, it was asynchronous and there was no little um, bobbing head. Uh, in the presentation, you've just seen also asynchronous. There were two bobbing heads. And what you're going to do now is you're going to turn over to, to Debbie. Debbie is going to do a live presentation. And I know Megan's got some other tricks up his sleeve. So there's a, there are different kinds of presentations that are taking place today. And that is also indicative of the kinds of things that our students will be experiencing. So Debbie, over to you. Do you want to take control and share your presentation or put yourself yeah, in maximum screen mode? Um, OK, so I'm, what I'm going to try and do is is share my um, screen. Um, and I'm hoping that my face appears in a little block. Um, I just realized that I, I did actually check this yesterday, but it, but that was when I was working with two screens and I came to my office to make sure I had stable internet and now I don't have two screens. So <laughs> I tested my, my system in a, under different circumstances. So. Yeah, maybe what I can just do is, uh, where is this here? Yeah. Let me share that. And I need to share the sound as well. Yes. And then over here, if I go to that. Okay. So I guess my question now is, can you see, uh, I don't have my video on. Um, can you still see me speaking while with this on or not? Maybe you're a perfect talking head. Okay. <laughs> can you? But can you see my slides? We can see your slides, and we can see you, and we can hear you. So it's over to okay. you. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. So, so um, you know, I was kind of blindsided by this uh, this request to do this because uh, we were saying on the saucy board that this would be a great. Um, uh, workshop to have and that we should find really great people to present it and I was making all sorts of recommendations and then it came back to bite me as it often does where then I got the phone calls to say guess what you're it so here I am and uh, similarly to um, to to Karen sorry to Karen and Helen and uh, Johnson I am certainly no expert and all I'm going to do is um, share what I what I've learned and um, and what I've read and my observations over this last period and and before that. OK, so the 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 focus of my talk is engaging students. Online during a global health crisis. Um, so there were various challenges and opportunities that that this presented. So first of all, the course that I was set to teach was called intercultural communications and competency. And um, in the first semester, I had taught this in in class and um, had all my slides and had structured in class activities, a lot of discussion, some um, weekly activities online and everything and I had worked well, I got great student feedback. And um, now I had to go completely online. And the idea of teaching a complementary studies course on communication and intercultural competency um, online was really quite daunting. I um, added to this, I wasn't teaching students that I knew. I was teaching students who were in different departments uh, that I don't know and had, had never met. And um, so instead of being able to arrive in class, meet them, see their faces, get a feeling for who's in the class and to gauge 
what's happening in the class week by week, you know, whether they are all tired because they've been pulling all nighters because there's a big project due or they're all excited because there's some sports event coming up over the weekend or whatever, all of that kind of nonverbal communication that I utilize a lot in my classroom to, to understand who my students are and what's happening with them and to, to gauge what I'm going to be doing in the class, even though I've got a, a basic plan, um, I, I wasn't going to have that kind of feedback. And it really was pretty much felt like I was talking to a brick wall. Um, and so, yeah, that and, and the first class, I really did feel like, like now I've got used to it. Again, here, I'm busy talking to a computer screen and it's a very abstract, surreal experience um, when you're not used to it. Even now, it's it's a bit surreal. So um, the one thing that I did realize is that I was going to have to uh, create some sort of vibe in the class, some sort of connection with my students to get them into the idea that they were all going to be um, expected to interact in this class and that that was a core part of this class. So the first activity that I gave them was this activity here. So this is the intercultural communication and competency class, 220 years um, students, final year students. Let me just press pause here. Can you, can you guys hear the, the sound coming through? Yes, we can hear it clearly. Okay, I'll press. And, and what the students had to do is they had to go to Padlet, click on this video, and then start capturing what they thought about, about this song, particularly looking at the different cultures and how they Amazing. communicate. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry. I, I clicked my screen by mistake. So, yeah. This was one of the things that I tried. Um, there was a, a myriad of other things that I tried. I tried online discussion forums. This was actually for material science where I was just um, supporting. I wasn't uh, lecturing this class, I was supporting it, but we had different topics that students would ask questions about and weigh in about. Um, in for strength of material, second year course, I had students um, send problems in um, that they were struggling with. And then I would have a Q&A session that I would do via Teams where I would use my um, tablet and like I would on a blackboard in class, go through the problems with them in class. Um, I used a collaborative whiteboard where um, the students would all log in via Teams. And then we would, in this case, um, uh, brainstorming the diversity of diversity of what what how where can you find diversity and and students just went and typed whatever they thought to them um, online polls where uh, they weigh in on different theories on culture that we were learning about um, and then uh, I also used online chat rooms where they had to watch a video or read an, uh, an assignment and then they had this chat based discussion on on, on the different topics that they were looking at. So the, so when I was preparing for this presentation, I was trying to think about um, what, what was it really that made these things work or not? And, and what was the, the, the thing that was, was common? And um, 
So the one thing that I, I realized is that all of these are basically active learning activities. And this is similar to what I would have done in class anyway, but it's just online. And so what's at the core of active learning? What did I learn from my previous experience is that you need buy-in, you need student engagement for active learning to work. And that's kind of like a, a heart and court, court and horse, horse and cart situation because um, active learning is meant to drive student engagement, but unless your students are engaged, they're not going to participate in the active learning activities. So, you know, what do you kind of do there? So typically what I would do in class is how I get them to motivate them to get to engage because students don't like active learning at first. They want to be passive. They want to sit and just listen and uh, WhatsApp and look on their phones and whatever while they are supposedly learning. But when you start, um, again, looking at Bloom's taxonomy and, and telling them about how um, sitting in a lecture, reading the assignment, watching your podcasts or videos, um, watching a demonstration, this is all just tipping the iceberg of the learning. And it's really when they start doing things that, that the real learning happens and driving that in and repeating it, then they begrudgingly start to, to engage. But what I realized then in thinking about all of this is that what I was really thinking about is how do I get students to, to get on board, to start digging deeper and reaping the rewards of this unique learning environment that they're part of for these few years? And, and, and how do I, I get them to start doing that? Um, and I realized that what I really do is I spend quite a lot of time on the relationship, on the effective part of my teaching and learning experience, building rapport between students. And so I uh, Googled <laughs> rapport and students. And then I found that this is really is something that is, is, is researched and that it is something that, um, that really makes a, a big difference in the classroom. So rapport um, is an alliance that's based on trust. And if you look at the teacher-student relationship, then what you want, the rapport that you're building, what you want it to look like is that um, you've got the extent to which students accept or buy into the goals that the teacher has spelled out in class. This is coming from that article that I just, just had up there. Um, <clears throat> um, the student's ability to walk, work towards these goals. So this is a relationship that you're building. And once you build that trust relationship, that rapport, then the students are also bringing their side. They, they are saying, yes, I, I agree. I've bought into this. I understand that I've got to bring something to the table. The teacher's ability to care genuinely for students and to nurture their learning. So that again, I think Helen was uh, said about empathy, bringing empathy and letting the students know that you care about their learning and where what you're doing. You're not just throwing assessments at them that you actually want to get, get them to learn. And um, the student and teacher connect emotionally and students' motivation to participate actively in their edu education. So all of this is, is nothing about the content. It's nothing about what little gimmicks no, you're using. Not. I was crazy a very long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I think somebody is not on mute. Uh, Teresa, your, your, your mic is not on mute at the moment. You might want to switch it on mute. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, so all of this is about creating a relationship um, and building trust between the students and, and the teacher. And I think that um, we get so overwhelmed. Well, I know, let me rather say, I know I get so overwhelmed with everything that I have to do that um, I sometimes don't spend time doing that. But when things do work, it's because I've spoken to the students like they are people and like we are in this together, this collaborative approach to planning their learning experience. And, and, and students do respond well to that. That has been my experience. And there is a, an inertia, there is an activation energy, a hill you've got to get over. But once they you get the ball rolling, then they, they appreciate that. So um, from that same article, I'll just, I won't read this through. You can read this yourself. I'll give you some time to read this. I just thought that this really does get the crux of, of what I'm trying to say here.
so a lot of these things, you know, they view with cynical reserve, the exhortations and instructions of teachers. This is where our frustration lies. We're putting all this effort. We're having these forums and, and putting all these activities and we get such a, a low response rate. Um, and, and then that's just demotivating for, for, the, for the teacher. Um, and I think really the core underneath all of this is that trust relationship. The student has to trust that the teacher is not doing this to defer responsibility onto the student so that they don't have to do their work. They're doing this to help the student learn. And that has to be a belief that the students held, holds for these activities to work well. So a couple of last thoughts from the things that I've read. How many students do you actually need in order for an activity to be successful? So I think, I mean, obviously, if you're talking about assessments where everybody needs to get a mark and so on, then that's a different situation. But if we're just talking about the day-to-day -day activities and participation, the, even in the classroom, even not everybody comes to lectures, not everybody in the lecture puts their hands up. Yes, you can call on people and put them on the spot and so on. But this idea of social contagion, which is actually something that I learned of when I was teaching um, this cultural intercultural studies, is 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 and social learning, this peer learning that happens. That's that's how I learned as a student was you know speaking to this person in the class who gets it and um, saying, oh, I missed that. Do you have notes on that? I think when we're online, we're expecting more participation than what actually happens face in, in face to face. Not everybody needs to log on. They don't have to all log on at the same time. Some can watch the recordings. Some can um, do this activity, but not that activity. Um, I think that's something that we must think about that we don't have to have 100% participation for things to be successful. Another thing that I definitely focused on quite a bit was the issues of diversity and inclusion, alienation and engagement. Um, I asked the students, how would you like this assessment to work? Would you like it to be a quiz? Do you want to hand in an essay? Do you want to have um, do a chat room and be um, evaluated on your participation? And the, the interesting thing that I learned through this experience is that for as many students there are in the class, there are different ways that they want to be assessed or want to engage in learning. So you can't you can't address everybody's needs. But the other thing that I also found that was um, from this paper from Ish and Al um, in 2014 um, is that there are a lot of cultural and personality factors that are going to come in when you are assessed, when you as a lecturer are um, evaluating how much engagement students have in the classroom and thinking, well, they're just all bored. But um, I mean, I'm not expecting you to read all of this now. I'll send the slides out and, and I've got the links to the papers. You can go and read them. But um, there are different reasons why students will speak up or won't speak up or will write on the boards or won't write on the boards or so, so on. And so offering a wide variety of um, learning opportunities helps to give different people different opportunities to learn. So, um, and asking the students what they need also helps them to feel that they are empowered in their learning. Um, and then finally, in incentivizing participation, some of them buy into the whole Bloom's taxonomy thing. But the other thing that I also found was really um, valuable, and this also came out of teaching this course, is that incentivizing active participation, you can make that a professional development task and you can tell them the reason why it's important for you to participate here is for your own professional development. There was a very interesting um, article that I read, read by Trevlin um, and I actually gave it to the students to, to read where he looks from a kind of social sciences perspective on what do engineers do on a day-to-day -day basis in their, in their jobs. And, um, and he did a literature review on, on, on studies like this going back many years. And consistently, about 60% of the time, an engineer is interacting with other people, conversing with them and sending reports backwards and forwards, getting information and so on. What's also interesting is that a lot of engineers who write for, for academics and engineering faculty ourselves place the technical aspect of the engineering curriculum very importantly and the interaction, the social aspects at the periphery. And this does not reflect what's happening in the workplace. So 
you can really leverage participation in these activities in class by giving them a paper like this and saying, if you don't believe me, here it is, the importance of your social skills, being able to collaborate and to be able to, to discuss technical things with other people is core to being a good engineer. And um, the students really, I found, they responded very well to this. And in the student feedback, there was a number of students who kept on saying, um, uh, Prof Blaine made it really um, clear to us why this was important. And that really helped us to buy into this and to, and to and then the, the, the activities were relevant to that and so on. So I think contextualizing what they're doing is really important and building that relationship is really important. So here are a couple of, of, of readings and also references to the, the images and so on that I've used in the talk. And that's where I'm going to stop. Um, that was just the thoughts that I had on engaging students online. Debbie, thank you very much. And uh, notwithstanding your comments from earlier, I think everybody can see why you were chosen to, to present on the work that you've done in your classroom last year. It's, it's quite clear that you put some real effort into getting the students to engage. So now, Megan, over to you. Um, you also would, um, are going to share some aspects of your classroom practice that from the sounds of it is actually really very interesting. Sure, thank you, Brandon. And, uh... Thank you to the speakers uh, preceding me. Yeah, uh, I really learned quite a bit in the next, in the last half an hour or forty minutes. So most of you probably have never met me, have never seen me. Uh, so I've almost appeared as dark energy uh, in this forum. So I just want to thank thank you guys for having some faith in me, especially on a Friday afternoon. I'm going to switch on my mic, and as I mentioned to uh, Brandon, I have a face for radio. So hold on to your seats, and uh, that's basic. Let's get that right. That's me over here. And uh, yeah, so I'm based at the Durban University of Technology. So just a little bit of background uh, as to, I'm not sure whether you guys can hear me properly. Yeah, we can hear you loud and, we can hear you loud and clear. Would this be better? But both were working equally well. It's up to you what you right. like. Okay, so just a little bit of uh, background. Um, I'm an astrophysicist by training. Uh, that's just a big word that doesn't mean much. Uh, and my career started off in a very strange way. So I started off teaching at uh, Technicon, that was Technicon Natal, and that was in the Department of Physics, and then moved on to the University of KwaZulu Natal, where I was teaching engineering for quite a number of years, so in the mathematics department, and then returned. Uh, a decade later to the Durban University of Technology in the Department of Mathematics, where for the last five years I've been teaching, uh, obviously, first year engineering. Now, why first year engineering? I mean, these classes are large. And I think uh, one of the real big problems is keeping the attention span or even getting people interested in attending and also doing well in, uh, in, in the classroom. So pre-COVID, what really worked for me was the idea of introducing demonstrations and then making uh, the subjects relevant. Obviously, in this case, it was mathematics, engineering mathematics, and uh, specifically calculus. So the idea was to show the relevance, not just in engineering, but in everyday life. So my philosophy pre-COVID was always to connect the mathematics, the physics to the real world. And what I tried to do there was obviously by use of examples, and more importantly, by demonstrations. So that required me to do a lot of research on how I presented my, my lectures and also on the demonstrations themselves. So that's basically uh, where I'm coming from. And I just want to very quickly just present, uh, can I share that screen now? Let me switch off that so that nightmare is gone. And yeah, there we go. So, and feel free to stop me uh, uh, if you have any questions or comments. And so I titled it The Marriage Between Math and Physics, Solving Real World Problems. And that's basically when I see myself in the classroom, that's essentially what I uh, intend, intend doing or the aim of each of my lectures. And that is to, to couple what I'm teaching in terms of mathematics and physics and not for them to just see it as writing an exam at the end or a series of tests. Uh, you know, it was mentioned earlier as well, where students cram in the last minute. And that's really not creating any knowledge because 
few weeks down the line, a month down the line, you ask them the same questions and they wouldn't be able to recall or solve these problems. And then all of that uh, work is lost. So very simple. And so my real interest in teaching is pro solving real world problems uh, and, and mathematical modeling. So be it in first year, second year, or even you know, postgraduate level, I think this is uh, the aim of the game. And uh, I keep doing this. So one of the things I found, and I spent a lot of time actually working with teachers from schools, is that we fall prey to the idea of uh, solve for X syndrome. You know, we're given a simple equation and then we simply ask the students solve for X. So I'll give you a simple example. I'm just trying to, just for demonstration purposes, you know, X plus one equals to zero, solve for X. And everyone would just put up their hands, shout out, well, X is equal to minus one. The real question is, what does X really mean? Is there a physical bearing for X? So, you know, this is a linear equation. Why not, rather than give them a series of equations to solve, system of linear equations, you're looking at, say, for instance, matrices, where do these equations come from? I mean, uh, is it just some maths guy sitting there at his computer screen at night thinking of systems of three uh, equations in three variables, four variables, or is it based on maybe a simple problem of say two blocks, mass M1, mass M2, force applied. You could throw in some friction just to make it exciting as well. And then solve that system um, using Newtonian physics. And there you have you know, a couple system of equations. So it becomes more interesting. Well, up to a certain point. What if you really connected these blocks up attach them to screen, pull it across the uh, table, get the students to see this, and then ask them to solve the problem. So that's essentially what I do. So it's a very hands-on approach. Um, this was pre-COVID. So the question I asked was, well, can this happen online? Is it possible to take demonstrations into the online class? And as mentioned earlier, you know, not every student will attend a lecture. So right at the beginning in last year when I was teaching Math 1A, Engineering Math 1A, it was a very small percentage of students that showed up. And the reason for that is they had access to the recordings and we were going through you know, simple problems and uh, which they could actually follow from the textbooks as well. So it didn't make sense for them to actually attend those lessons. And then obviously there were problems with data, there, was, there were problems with devices and this, the list goes on and on. So what I started doing was firstly, uh, making the course more applicable. So rather than just say, here's a series of questions, I want you to have them solve for a tutorial. I basically started taking these sections and then modifying them and connecting them to, to reality. So the simple case of, you know, here's a graph y equal to three X minus two. Now we can all solve that. That's been done since grade eight, I think. Uh, but then again, where are linear functions important? How can we use them in everyday life as an engineer, as a physicist, as a chemist, all right? And that basically started getting the attention. So I'll give you a simple example, modeling of temperature, all right? Um, we're not gonna go through this entire thing, but uh, you know, with the data given, you can model the temperature and not just at a given height, but once you've got the, um, the formula, you've got the graph, you can, vary H and you can get the temperature, but it's a simplistic example, all right? Negative numbers, a simple thing like this. You'd be surprised at first year, if you ask students to define an integer, you will be surprised that they can't do it. They don't know what an integer is. So going through that, negative numbers, why are they important? Well, I basically start to look at examples that we can see around. The case of charge, cathode rays, if you're looking at electrons orbiting a nucleus, well, this is a classical picture. Bank balances, and I'm, being an academic, I think we probably used to that every now and then your bank balance going into a negative value. But uh, these are the, you know, the applications that we can actually see. Waves and periodic motion. But before I go there, let's just go back to the concept of temperature. And I think this really worked well. I'll give you an example of one of my demonstrations. And one of my favorite ones is the use of liquid nitrogen in class. Uh, I'm not sure whether you can actually see my, the video. 
Anyone? Uh, which which bit are you talking about? Uh, not the. Should I just stop sharing or? No. So so the we can see your video clearly. Um, the, your slides. Is there a particular video you're looking for? No, no. Basically, just uh, no, no. my face. <laughs> That's what yeah. I want to do. You can see your face clearly. Oh, okay, great. So uh, yeah, so I basically started doing demonstrations in the room where I'm sitting right now to an audience, to my students out there. So one of my classic demonstrations would be the use of liquid nitrogen and the whole idea of looking at say negative numbers because you know the liquid nitrogen boils at minus 196 degrees Celsius. So rather than speak of negative numbers, let's try and bring in some liquid nitrogen and show them what it is like to have something at minus 196 degrees Celsius. So I'm not sure whether you can actually see that. We can see it clearly. Yep, so there we have minus 196 degrees Celsius. You know that if a student is in class and he watches this, he's gonna call his mom, his dad, his neighbors for this moment, just to have a look at this. And you know, you can't do this for every lesson but you know, once a week or a couple of times, you know, just bringing in something that's really cool, something that's you know that you can demonstrate that they've not seen in class before, that has some sort of application, you're going to have a full house, and that's basically what was happening last year in my class. We're going from an initial 10% to 90 to 100% attendance in class just by bringing in these demonstrations and then linking it to the syllabus. So that was really, really useful. You'd know uh, the simple question if I asked anyone, what happens if I dunked a, a balloon into liquid nitrogen that was inflated? Um, and let me just try that because I, I think it'll be really useful for everyone to see that. Uh, this, is a, this really gets students coming to class as well and participating and being excited as well. So very quickly, ha, hole in a balloon. So. <laughs> That was a balloon from DUT, another hole in the balloon. But the idea was if there was no hole in the balloon, if I put that into liquid nitrogen, you know, basically what's gonna happen is the balloon is actually gonna contract, right? Because it, inside the balloon is gonna get really, really cold and it's the volume's gonna decrease and then take it out of the liquid nitrogen. And then what actually happens, the air inside starts to warm up, the vapor, the balloon seems to self-expand and you know what, you got a class at the edge of their seats, they're looking straight into their screens and also sharing this moment, also sharing the videos that we uploaded say on Moodle, for instance. The other thing that really worked well for me was a YouTube channel, which I started a few years ago before COVID, started adding stuff on there and that became really useful uh, during the last, uh, you know, the, the last two semesters of 2020. Now in the second semester, something really happened interesting happened. And that is I was given to teach Introduction to Applied Sciences, a course that I never thought of, uh, ne never taught before. And this was for marine students. So this course consists of four sub modules and that was mathematics, physics, chemistry, and stats. Four sub modules being taught over a 13 week period. But here's the real challenge in this course. Some of those students did not do physics or chemistry or even stats. And so I was tasked to taking this to the students, getting them to buy, firstly buy into coming into class, all right? And then making the subject relevant, relevant enough so that they can actually write the exam and pass comfortably. And it really happened and it worked out really, really well. We had a brilliant pass rate, but the feedback um, was really interesting. And most of the students, their comments were, were very, very similar. And that was, the course was relevant. The subject material was relevant. I could see the applications in the course and in my career moving forward. And I think that was the key. It wasn't things like, it helped me in the exams. Well, it did help in the exams. That's just part of the deal. But the more important thing is they started to see the applications. They started to see the relevance. And I think that became really, really important. So I basically teach things in a very simplified way. I use a lot of uh, animations, a lot of movement. And uh, so I'm exploring something that's really new now. Uh, we managed to get a, a large whiteboard, managed to convince the university with a camera 
So, you know, basically teaching physically in front of the camera, front of the camera, using a whiteboard, and then, you know, using this via Zoom or Teams to teach. So there will be demonstrations, there'll be rockets flying around. Um, and then, you know, students be, being able to see that. So it's very close or very similar to what is happening physically in the classroom. They could see things blowing up, they could hear stuff in the background. And, uh, you know, that's going to be a really cool uh, experience for them. So basically, my teaching is really an experience. I don't like to call it lectures. Uh, I don't like to, I don't refer to uh, exams, for instance, and tests. So it's all about knowledge creation. It's about fun, enjoyment. And at the end, obviously, <laughs> there's learning that's got to take place. And it's amazing that it actually does work. Um, like, for instance, examples like wave and periodic motion. You'd be surprised as well. Um, not just in first year, but second year, if you have a look at this and you ask people to describe a wave, uh, you know, they sort of think of a wave as something that's traveling along. And why start with something as complicated as a transverse wave versus a longitudinal wave? Why can't we start with a Mexican wave? You know, um, so start off with something that they can relate to. And then essentially what you see as the wave seems to travel around the stadium, it's the only thing that's happening that's generating this entire thing are the people that are standing up and down. That's essentially what it is, particle motion over there. And you have this wave that's grabbing around the stadium. So if we try to, as I said, not win students over, but not even get down to their level, but if you could break it down in a very transparent way and articulate your teaching uh, you know, in a simple way, I think that that'll be great. So I'm not sure how many mathematicians are amongst us today or physicists, but uh, simple things like solids of revolution. We always start off with really complicated curves. Y is equal to arc tan of, I don't know, E to the X squared is rotated about the Y axis. Why can't we just start off with a simple vertical line rotated about the Y axis, generate a cylinder. From there, we can work out, for instance, the volume, uh, moment of inertia and stuff like that. So these are the sort of little techniques that are operate in class. And as I said, pre-COVID, we were already doing demonstrations and now we've taken it uh, online and it seems to work really, really well. But most will argue that we don't have time. Time seems to run out. But I, that if we can get the attention, you know, for 90 to 100% of the time, rather than save time by not doing the demonstration, we'll be much more effective teachers in the classroom. You know, we want your students to be talking about this. No one's going to be talking about the integral of e to the x squared dx uh, over dinner, over WhatsApp, or some sort of social medium. But if I blow up a, a watermelon using liquid nitrogen, that's going to be the talk of the town. That's going to attract them to the videos. That's going to attract them to the lessons. And, and these are little connections that happen in their minds, and that'll help them learn as well. So this has been a really, really uh, interesting development for me, especially taking things online. There's YouTube, but that's very different from actually doing demonstrations via Teams or Zoom, because that is almost so real that you interact with the kids and they are able to talk to you in real time almost. And uh, yeah, so I think that seems to be working really well for us. Uh, the first talk on assessments, yes, you know, I speak as if uh, everything is smooth. We've always had problems with assessments, but uh, at DUT, the mathematics course is continuous assessment, beautiful, works really well. Nobody ever gets a big fright. You know, heart doesn't go pounding because there's a big, a big exam coming up and 50 or 60% of that exam contributes to the final mark. So we break it down into smaller sections and so we can breathe and live more easily over the semester and there's learning taking place. Not just learning for the semester. I mean, we are learning for life here and I think that's very, very important as well. So that's my simple contribution. Uh, you could actually go to my YouTube channel. I'll share the links. Um, and uh, yeah, the other thing that I did have as well that helped a lot was uh, access via WhatsApp through the class rep. So there was 24 seven access. If someone saw a purple light in the sky and wants to know what it was, or had some question about something relates to black holes, they were able to, to, to speak to me as well. So, and I think that's very, very important in building a relationship with the students, not just for a particular course 
and uh, the exam or test being an outcome, but also you know, a larger social aspect as well. So they must be able to be free enough to communicate with you uh, at different levels. And I think that's very important. And that's what worked in, uh, for us last semester. And I'm looking forward to a really beautiful uh, first semester of 2021. So thank you so much for that. I'll switch off this uh, screen, uh, stop share. And over to you, Brandon, thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and and normally, and in normal circumstances, what you'd do is we'd all be able to clap and show our appreciation to the three to the to the three um, case studies and the four speakers that have been participating today. But I'm sure what you what you would have seen is why we chose why we chose these individuals. They've really done some some really insightful things and really found ways to engage their their students in the classroom. So. We're now moving to the next stage. And what we're going to do now is, is I'm going to, to split you off into three groups.